All right, welcome everyone. As we approach the end of June, also known as Fireworks Safety Month, we can see July 4th is on the horizon. And while there are many people that enjoy fireworks at this time of year, that can be a very risky proposition in some parts of the country. I'm referring specifically to the western half of the United States, where if you haven't checked the U.S. drought monitor lately, well, it's incredibly dry out there. And to the experts, this probably isn't much of a surprise. They're calling for the 2020 fire season to be extreme and destructive, especially in rural mountain areas and communities located in the wild land urban interface. It's easy to get discouraged and saddened by the prospects of yet another devastating fire season. But we've got Mike Tarantino of the Colorado State Fire Forest Service and Michelle Steinberg of NFPA with us today. And they've got information about how to protect communities from wildfires, including home hardening recommendations. They're also going to talk about the concept of defensible space. And they'll discuss vegetation management guidelines, important forest health trends, available resources and grants, and key landowner actions to improve fire risk mitigation. Now that I've told you what's on the docket for today, let me introduce our co-presenters. Michelle Steinberg is a returning guest on the webinar series. She is the Wildfire Division Director at the National Fire Protection Association, where she leads a team dedicated to wildfire safety education, advocacy, and outreach. She serves on the Board of Directors at the International Association of Wildland Fire and co-founded the Hazard Mitigation and Disaster Recovery Membership Division of the American Planning Association. A quick word about the NFPA, by the way, it's a nonprofit that is the home of wildfire-related projects like the FireWise USA Recognition Program and Wildfire Community Preparedness Day. Now, our other guest is making his webinar series debut today. Mike Tarantino is a seasoned fire and land management professional. He has worked with the U.S. Forest Service Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and USGS. He's currently a forester for the Colorado State Forest Service and has previously worked as a wildfire mitigation specialist for the West Region Wildfire Council. Now, during the course of today's presentation, I hope you'll submit questions for our guests. To do so, simply use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel over on the right side of the screen. I'll review those questions and pose them to Michelle and Mike during both the Q&A time set aside after the presentation, but we're also gonna take some questions during the transition between presenters, kind of like we did last week. So, Mike, you're batting lead off today. All right, and thank you, Mike. Um, so, and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. We're here to talk to you about uh, being prepared for wildfire. Um, I did want to highlight the pictures on this title slide as it is proof that Landowners who take action ahead of a fire can make a difference uh, should their properties be impacted by a wildfire event. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about my agency. I'm a forester for the Colorado State Forest Service. I'm working out of the Gunnison Field Office. Um, our field office is working with residents in Gunnison County, Hinsdale County, and Northern Sawash County. Um, but our agency as a whole is an outreach and an extension agency of the Warner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University. And our mission is to achieve stewardship of Colorado's diverse forest environments for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, our staff um, serves as a resource for landowners, homeowners, and communities so they have the, uh, the knowledge to fully prepare for future wildfires. And this map on the screen here shows the location of all our field offices throughout the state and four geographical areas. Um, so we're here today to talk about the wildfire issue. Um, wildland fires are a critical physical and ecological phenomena that shape the structure and function of our vegetative landscapes around the globe. Uh, there's numerous ecosystems across the western U.S. that are um, that are directly influenced by fire and involved with uh, the disturbance of wildfire on the landscape. However, it becomes an issue um, as wildfires do remain a serious threat to society as they can cause property damage and damage to critical infrastructure. They can negatively impact the goods and services that we expect from the wildlands and they can result in the loss of life. Um, so, so what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking about the physics of wildfire, how a wildfire burns, um, when a wildfire becomes a catastrophe, 
and how to prepare for the event of a wildfire. So for wildfire to start, we need an ignition. An ignition happens um, when an ignition source impacts a receptive fuel bed. Um, a natural ignition source can be a dry lightning strike, or as Mike referenced uh, at the start of this presentation, um, ignitions can be human caused, whether that's from um, careless use of fireworks, maybe an escaped campfire, potentially from utilities or a roadside ignition. Fire is really dictated by, um, by three things. So we have two triangles up on the screen here. The triangle on the left uh, is, is, the, is the basic fire, uh, fire behavior triangle. So when you have uh, a proper balance of fuel, oxygen, and heat, an ignition occurs. Now, as that fire grows on the landscape, we can get a wildfire event which is really dictated by the wildfire triangle dominated by uh, fuels, topography, and weather. I did want to take some time to dive a little bit deeper into, into the wildfire triangle and how, how these, these three legs of the triangle really do influence wildfire behavior. So we're going to take a little uh, a closer look at topography. Um, steep slopes, drainages, and shoots dramatically increase wildfire behavior and intensity. Um, the physical properties behind this is as hot gases generated from a wildfire event rise upslope, they can preheat the, the vegetation upslope of the ignition, uh, dictating the rate of spread and direction of a wildfire. The diagram here shows the, the, the similar physical characteristics of a, of a chimney in a log cabin. Uh, those same physical properties are uh, play at a landscape level in a wildfire event where uh, topography, topography can influence uh, the rate and direction of these hot gases and, and where, a wildfire, where, where a wildfire will go. Um, some pictures here that illustrate this, this phenomenon. Uh, the picture on the left uh, shows a, a fire in a fairly steep drainage um, with um, with the, the hot gases from that plume downslope running uphill and, and the, the torching uh, licking the vegetation above it. Um, the picture on the right shows, uh, shows how slope can influence fire behavior. Uh, some of these steep slopes impacted by wildfire likely had a pretty significant fire behavior, and, and that's apparent looking at the, the landscape scale impact of a fire on, on those steep slopes there in that picture. Um, getting to the, to the next arm of the wildfire triangle, we really wanted to talk about fuels. Fuels are any combustible material, so fuels can be live or dead vegetative material. Fuels can be houses, sheds, cars, gas cans, decks, firewood piles, uh, anything that can burn is a potential wildland fuel. Um, on the landscape, the types of wildland fuels that, that are present are surface fuels, uh, logs, grasses and forbs and shrubs, uh, debris such as pine needle, leaves, litter, or wood chips on the forest floor. Uh, we have ladder fuels that are smaller trees, uh, low hanging branches or, or shrubs underneath the drip line of overstory trees. And then we have crown fuels or, or, or fuels in the canopy. Uh, and, and as crown fuels burn, they do result in the highest intensity fire. Um, how fire burns through these fuels are, are, are really dictated by uh, three physical events. These uh, fire can, can carry on all along the landscape and these fuels either through uh, conductive heat uh, with direct flame contact from one fuel source to the fire, uh, from radiate, radiative heat or radiation uh, um, radiating out from the, the fire, uh, preheating fuels until they reach their flash point and they combust, or convective heat, uh, which is, is heat rising directly up from the fire. Uh, this results in tree torching in a ladder fuel vent, or convective heat, say, on a steep drainage uh, can dictate the direction and, and rate of spread of a fire. 
Um, I did want to talk briefly about the current conditions we're dealing with as far as fuel loading on the landscape. Um, alter alterations in historic fire cycles due to wildfire suppression may have led to the dangerous build of fuels in some areas. Um, over the past 100, 120 years, we have been very effective at suppressing wildfire on the landscape, but that may have resulted in denser forests in some areas. Uh, the picture on this slide here is, is, is a picture from 1890 and a picture from, from the same area in 2000 of, cheese, of the Cheeseman Reservoir area in the Colorado Front Range. Um, you can see on the landscape how after 110 years, uh, the, the forest conditions are um, significantly denser than they were in 1890, uh, most likely due to uh, the influence of wildfire on the landscape and our suppression efforts. Now transitioning into that third leg of the wildfire triangle, uh, we want to talk about weather. So, so weather really dictates how fire moves on the landscape. High fire weather conditions are affected by prolonged periods of drought, leading to decreased fuel moisture, low relative humidity preventing fuel moisture recovery, and strong winds that allow for wildfire spread. Um, I did want to, to highlight this thermograph here that shows that there's a direct relationship between temperature and relative humidity. As temperature rises, relative humidity de decreases. Uh, so generally in the summer during wildfire season, we see um, peaks in fire behavior uh, on, on hot summer days later in the afternoon as that relative humidity declines. I did want to, to touch a little bit on how climatic conditions uh, may be influencing uh, the, the weather that we're dealing with now and how they may influence uh, wildfires. So uh, changing climatic conditions may uh, increase the fire season where um, our, our, our dates of uh, snow-free days are coming earlier and our dates of first snow are coming later in the season. So there's an increased uh, season length of fire season. Um, sand conditions can be altered through drought stress. The picture on the slide here is uh, from the spruce beetle epidemic in the San Juan Mountains of Southern Colorado, um, much uh, which was most likely influenced by climate related drought conditions. Um, this forest is going to have a significantly altered fuel arrangement due to the, to the pest activity that is influenced sand conditions. Um, and then also there can be an increase in high fire weather days or red flag days. Uh, high fire weather conditions may be a result of the changing of the changing climate. So I did. I wanted to just circle back and 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 say that uh, wildfire behavior can really is really dictated by three main things: fuel, weather, and topography. Um, now, when we add the human element into this. And we add uh, homes in high wildfire risk areas. We have an ignition source and we have all the factors of a wildfire triangle in place. We do have the potential for catastrophe. Um, I'm going to take this, this moment here to, to, to pass this off to Michelle with the NFPA. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about how fires burn in, in these catastrophic, or excuse me, how homes burn in these catastrophic fire events. Mike, Mike, before we uh, do transition over to Michelle and uh, we'll switch the screen over, we did have a question from Cameron. <clears throat> Wanted to know um, if you've got any resources, and, and you may cover this as we go, but uh, do you have any resources to assist in design approaches that can minimize fire or firestorm damage to buildings? Um, because they're seeing many buildings uh, here, and I'm not sure exactly where Cameron is at, but um, many buildings are faced with either EFIS or uh, plastic roofing materials or vinyl windows. So any recommendations on that? Yeah, thank you, Mike. And, and I think we're gonna answer a lot of Cameron's questions um, through, through the rest of this presentation, but um, absolutely, we are gonna hopefully provide you with some inform information and resources to, to better prepare yourselves for wildfire if you are living in a high risk area. All right, very good. We'll transition over to Michelle now. Michelle, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I am gonna leave my webcam off and I believe I need to change my display setting. Uh, 
to swap it out. So Mike, you will let me know if this is working. People can see my screen. Uh, well, yep, there it is. It looks good to me. And there it is. All right. So thanks so much, uh, everyone. I am. Uh, my name is Michelle Steinberg. I'm with the National Fire Protection Association. Um, I am looking at my own screen and seeing my co-presenter here. So I want to make sure I can see my slides. Uh, let's see. How come I'm not seeing that? Audience view. Okay. I can see your slides just fine, Michelle. How do I adjust what I'm seeing? Could you help me with that? Um, okay, so you're able to see Mike. Yes. Okay. Do you see a silver bar kind of going across the uh, horizontally across the screen? Yes. You might want to so hide all up. Can... Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. Thank you so much. Sorry about Bye -bye. that. So. Um, when we talk about uh, these different these different issues, you know, the catastrophe piece is when we lose structures and homes and entire communities to wildfires. So this is what my job is at the National Fire Protection Association in our wildfire division. And I want to share with you some of the things that we've learned over the years about how homes ignite in wildfires and what we can do to prevent it. Ah, okay. So we work nationally at the National Fire Protection Association on this problem of homes burning in the places that we refer to sometimes as the wildland urban interface, um, which really is not a place, but more of a set of conditions under which wildland fire reaches beyond uh, trees and other natural fuels to ignite homes in their immediate surroundings. And those examples are from all across the country. Um, you can find this just about anywhere. Um, so, um, this is important when you're thinking about what is what what actually uh, is a wildfire because some people think it has to be in a forest and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, a little bit about the uh, National Fire Protection Association or NFPA. We're a global nonprofit. We are are all about eliminating death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electric, and related hazards. And we've been in the uh, attempt to solve the wildfire disaster problem of homes and structures burning down uh, since 1985. And this is just a little bit of a snapshot of what does the problem look like these days. Uh, do note that this map is uh, only giving you a snapshot of about the last um, 20 years or so uh, in terms of where we've lost fires during single incidents uh, across the country. And so you see red dots, some of them are overlapping, so you know in 20 years they've had repeated large loss fires of anywhere between 500 and nearly 3,000 homes destroyed in a single incident. As you go further down the scale, those little yellow dots that you see many, many, many of in areas that you might not think about wildfire were wildfires where fewer homes, between one and 10, were destroyed, but that obviously there's plenty of wildfire potential uh, in recent years. and uh, the little tiny black dots that look like somebody sprinkled a pepper shaker over this map are incidents where no fire, uh, where fire occurred, but no structures were lost. If you look at sort of the east, the eastern area of the Apple, excuse me, the Appalachian Mountains, you'll note that you know that's mostly uh, public parkland, uh, but it certainly points to the fact that fire is happening all across our country, and really it's that literal interface of where fire meets uh, human. Uh, development that is driving some of this issue. Um, so I want to speak to the next slide, which is sort of walking us through um, the cycle of of how homes are lost to wildfire and how we can break that cycle. So we know that, as Mike described, that the conditions for wildfire exist in many parts of the country, and when these fuels, the weather and topography line up just right and there's an ignition, you get a wildland fire. You get rapid fire spread through the vegetation that can be accompanied by very high intensities, uh, which make it very dangerous for our people and uh, living creatures and unfortunately for our urban environments, our homes, our landscapes. Um, so urban fire doesn't mean a fire in a city, it simply means fire in structures. And when wildland fire leaves the vegetative fuel, the trees and the grass, and starts to ignite homes, you will almost always see multiple 
ignitions happening at the same time because of ember cast, which I'll touch on, and other reasons. And pretty soon you could have dozens or hundreds of homes exposed and igniting all at once. This, of course, overwhelms fire suppression. There's just too much fire and too few resources in the form of firefighters, fire trucks, and water. Uh, so unlike when you call 911 if you have a kitchen fire and somebody comes right away, um, this is not possible in a wildland fire like I'm describing that starts to impact all these homes simultaneously. And unfortunately, this means that firefighters cannot do what they've been trained to do, which is to try to save your home. Uh, it's reduced fire protection at this point. The lack of resources in the face of this uh, urban conflagration really leads to reduced effectiveness, and the result is a disaster. Many homes are totally destroyed. If we could break this cycle and prevent the urban fire, prevent those home ignitions from happening, we will simply have wildland fire, which we have techniques to deal with and manage, um, and is sometimes a positive thing on the landscape, and we avoid uh, the death and destruction that we would see. And that's our whole goal with what we're trying to promote uh, at NFPA and along with our partners at the state level and, and other uh, great wildfire safety advocates. So this is why we talk about uh, the science behind how these homes ignite. There's a lot about wildfire that ha it veers into mythology about how homes ignite. We hear about homes exploding or homes uh, you know, uh, dissolving or something like this. There is actually pretty good science and research behind what actually goes on during a fire. And all of the research kind of evolved into coining this phrase, the home ignition zone. A lot of the early research was conducted um, by collaborators, but primarily um, a, a fire scientist named Jack Cohen. Dr. Cohen uh, just recently retired from the US Forest Service, the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Uh, and uh, he, through many observations, through experiments, through models, um, and many, many post-fire analyses, determined that the reasons home, homes ignite have to do with the structure itself and everything around it within a few hundred feet. But in other words, it's not mysterious. There's actually some, some observable uh, phenomenon going on here. So what is this home ignition zone? Just like in the cartoon, the center of the home ignition zone is the home. It's the building itself and everything around it um, out to 100 to 200 feet. And the reason we don't give us precise um, Number there is because it varies. Uh, your site will look different than this cartoon. You might live on a steep slope, which means you need to think about things that are further away affecting your home in the case of a wildfire. Uh, one of the things I wanna point out though is sort of this little saying at the bottom of the, the slide, if it's attached to the house, it's part of the house. So you have to take into consideration uh, what fire will ignite, and if it's igniting your fence and carrying the fire to your structure, if it's igniting your deck, if it's igniting uh, material that is um, attached to your house in any way and can burn up to your house. That's the thing you have to consider when you take steps to modify the ignition potential in this, in this uh, area, your home and everything around it within just 100 or so feet. So all of this research um, over time is giving us some good clues. Um, we talk about the little things, and I'll get into that. The little things are basically embers or firebrands. And one of the long, long, long-term observations going back to the 60s, uh, at least in this country, is if you've got a flammable roof, that is uh, pretty uh, dire, and you need to do something with it because it is just a big vulnerable surface for embers to collect, pile up, and burn the house from the roof down. Um, so this, we say it dominates the likelihood for, from, from ignition. So having a good roof really helps. Um, openings uh, in your home are vulnerable to embers as well. So attic vents, think about attic vents, think about open windows or doors. Um, garage vents sometimes are placed within a foot of the, uh, of the earth and uh, can have embers sweeping into those um, spaces, as well as things like pet doors, things we might not think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, complex roofs are also a complicating factor, even a non-flammable roof, if you're leaving uh, burning material on there long enough, and that's where the embers will, if you have places on your roof, nooks and crannies where leaves or needles pile up, that's exactly where the embers are going to go. And so those areas need special attention to prevent uh, that kind of ignition. Uh, good news is that fuel reduction, meaning getting rid of things that can burn around the home, is effective. And these techniques are to keep flames 
from touching the house or the vents, deck, porch, etc. Um, and keeping radiant heat from large flames at least 30 feet away from your structure and attachments. And uh, I'll get into what radiant heat looks like, but this is flames that don't even have to touch your house in order to ignite your house, which sounds terrifying, uh, but in fact is something that's relatively easy to mitigate for. Um, so understanding how homes ignite. This awesome picture was uh, provided to us by the Texas A&M Forest Service uh, that's had a lot of experience with fire. And you can see that there is not a wall of flame approaching this house. In fact, there's no fire in this picture except for on the front steps. And the little caption here, relatively fire resistant homes can ignite during low intensity wildfires if a path of combustible material such as stairs or support beams leads the fire up to the home. Now, if anybody was at home, uh, during this event, they could come out with a, a hose or a bucket of water and put that out. But as you, as you know, if you've ever uh, had to be evacuated, uh, again, firefighters are dealing with hundreds of homes exposed. Homeowners are not there. It's too dangerous for you to be there. But little things like this cannot, cannot be prevented uh, by intervention at the time. So the idea is that you make the home so that it's much harder to ignite than what's happening in this picture. Because if the home doesn't ignite, it can't burn. Um, so basically there's three main things going on during a wildfire in terms of the home vulnerability and they can all be happening at once. You can have embers and surface flames and crown fires all happening. But um, one of the big observations coming out of the research is that uh, some estimate up to 85 to 90 percent of homes are burning because of embers or firebrands. So we've got this little cartoon showing the burning material coming out of the trees and landing on the house. Um, and again, this can pile up not only on the structure, but right next to the structure in that really close space to the structure where you might have some mulch, you might have a wood pile, you might have your construction project that you're working on or your art project. Um, these seemingly insignificant things actually will take homes down again, because they're burning without anybody intervening during these big fires. Um, surface fire, and, and Mike did a great job of describing these with some great visuals earlier, um, but these are the smaller flames that are uh, running along the ground in grasses and brush and shrubs, and they also can then leap up into the trees by means of these ladders, these littler shrubs and small trees and brush if you've got a pretty dense uh, thicket near the home. So basically you do not want fire touching your house, and this is when we talk about surface fire, breaking up any um, fire, uh, any any fuel like dry leaves, dead grass, pine needles that are running right up to your house and will lead fire right there. And then crown fire, again, very scary, very, very dangerous for people to be near these large flames. This gentleman in the foreground uh, apparently is far enough away, um, but something that would um, kill a human being in a matter of uh, moments will actually take uh, several minutes to ignite, actually more than several minutes, closer to 30 minutes, to ignite a wood wall. And this is the experiments that kind of gave Dr. Cohen his aha moment back in the 90s was uh, keeping these large flames just a minimum of 30 feet from the home. If the fire is moving through these areas, is doesn't it doesn't stay long enough and it is not close enough to ignite a home by radiant heat alone. And so that was a big finding, and that's where a lot of our so-called defensible space advice comes from, is removing the sources of radiant heat that could ignite the house. So what do we do? How can we protect these homes? We can't control the wind, we can't control the topography, but we can control the fuel, which is our house itself and everything around it. And it's a package deal. Just doing the good roof, that's great. I, I admire you if you have put on a new good roof, um, but that alone is not going to uh, do it all. You also need to look at your home landscape, and Mike will be giving us some examples of how that looks in the Rocky Mountain area of, of what that can look like. And also to uh, do some home improvements, to retrofit or some say harden your home uh, so that it's more fire resistant. Um, so we'll go through a couple of those techniques. I think the most insidious thing, and I do want to emphasize this because so much of the uh, many decades of research talks about radiant heat defensible space, ignitions from firebrands are really critical. Now the opposite of radiant heat is true here of crown fire. These people in the pictures are not 
super comfortable, but they're not in immediate fear of their lives from these little embers. These are annoying. This is not fun. You might be getting, uh, you know, your clothing singed. But look what it's doing to the houses as these embers pile up in the nooks and crannies of the house or ignite the mulch and uh, pretty soon the whole home is engulfed. Uh, your home your home can't run away, or stop, drop and roll. So uh, these are the things that we have to pay a lot of attention to when we're working on our homes and our landscapes. So a quick list and then I'm going to stop after this slide of what you can do is obviously again I'm hammering on changing out your roof if you don't have a good roof and that will prevent uh, the ember ignition. Uh, installing double pane windows or tempered glass is a great um, upgrade and that will help with the problem of radiant heat but so will getting rid of large radiant heat sources like big bushes and trees really close to your house. Um, screening the vents and other openings in your home uh, with fine metal mesh that will prevent, it won't prevent airflow, but it will prevent or uh, slow down the embers that might try to get into your house. Um, if you're worried about fire sweeping through the grass coming up to your home, uh, installing walkways or other, um, you know, pavers, rock, anything we, we might call a hardscaping technique can look really pretty and can also break up the fire on the ground. Um, if you're, if it's time to replace your siding, you might think about fire resistant materials. There's lots of options, but again, a good way to mitigate for radiant heat is to not have a radiant heat source near your house. Finally, um, installing a metal gate or metal fencing uh, will help with that problem of attachments where little flames can leap up into your wood fence and carry it right to the house. You don't necessarily have to replace the whole thing, but installing a metal gate in the last few feet as it touches your house will actually break up the continuity of that fire coming to the house. So that's a really quick nutshell and we're going to give you a lot of resources that you can take with you by the end of this presentation. I'm going to pause now and hand it back to Mike to give you some more um, Rocky Mountain West specific ideas of what you can be doing. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, are you guys back on, on my presentation here? Yep, I see it. Uh, Mike, do you mind if I take a couple of questions before we uh, jump into yours? Yep, no, that'd be great. Let's take some questions. All right, great. So um, we were talking before about design approaches, and, and Mike, you had mentioned that we would get to those and, and talk about those on the way through. Um, uh, Ken mentioned uh, to us that the, there is a uh, a concrete covered structural panel uh, product that's out there that has survived two California wildfires. So that was a suggestion that Ken was throwing out there. Um, we had another question from Cameron though. Um, he's asking, what have you found regarding new fire rated cellulose dense pack installations? Does this pose a fire problem or, or not? So um, this is Oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, no, no, Michelle, go ahead and, and take this one. Yeah, um, I will say at NFPA, um, we're relying on the um, the standard testing um, organizations such as ASTM out there to talk about fire rating. Um, and that should be something as your uh, municipality or your state is looking at their building code uh, changes over time if they have a category of products uh, or materials that are allowed or not in high-risk areas that's really good to look at is what does the ASTM rating look like for fire resistance or uh, you know how long does it take to burn through um, I can't comment on specific products just because NFPA is a codes and standards organization so we're we're not really encouraged to, to do that um, but basically uh, what you want to look at is uh, fire rate so for example, um, roofing has been long classified and you can even find that on the labeling of roofing material. A class A roof means it is essentially a non-combustible roof. So um, it's, def it's, it's for sure that you know, people want to use a variety of materials and have a lot of options, but it's really great to take a look at um, whether it's your state uh, building code advice, whether it's um, one of our partner organizations I'll, I'll talk a bit more in a minute about is the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, much easier way to remember is IBHS, that does some testing on materials and uh, makes recommendations to, um, to uh, governments around, you know, what are some best, best techniques, best practices, um, 
in terms of that. So uh, you'd really want to check and see because uh, folks can make claims for their product. You know, it's a buyer beware situation. So you want to make sure if something is listed um, with one of the testing uh, testing um, uh, organizations as a non-combustible or a an ignition resistant product. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Michelle. And I mean, there there are numerous fire resistant building materials that landowners living at risk of wildfire can utilize, uh, whether that's uh, uh, fire uh, fire treated wood products impregnated with chemicals uh, through pressure treatment, or uh, maybe some of the the uh, the hardy board style concrete panels that are designed to look like wood siding. Um, all, all, all of those practices taken by landowners uh, really work to address the, the embering issue that Michelle was was uh, referencing in her presentation there. Um, so, so I didn't want to I didn't want to talk a little bit about who is at risk of wildfire. And throughout the Western United States, uh, that number seems to be growing. Um, in Colorado alone, there's approximately 2.9 million people now living within the wildland urban interface at risk of wildfire. And we really encourage uh, landowners to, to understand their level at risk. So as Michelle mentioned in her presentation, uh, not just landowners living in the forest are at risk of wildfire. Uh, homes in grassland, brushes, uh, excuse me, home, homes in grassland, brushland, or other non-forested but flammable wildland settings may be at risk of wildfire ignition. Um, and anyone at risk of wildfire really should become aware of their level at risk. Uh, many residents in the Wooly may not be aware of, that, of their risk. And in Colorado, we have, uh, we have some tools to help landowners understand the risk. Um, the Colorado Wildland uh, Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal is a great tool for, for landowners in our state to uh, research their property and understand what their risk level, risk level is. Now, if you are a landowner living in a high wildfire risk area, there are ways to mitigate your wildfire risk. And, and, and like Michelle was emphasizing in her presentation, we really want to start at the home and work our way out. So starting at the home is really addressing the ignition risk due to embering, and that's home hardening, really uh, uh, designing your house with ignition resistant materials, and then really emphasizing uh, the removal of flammable material within the home ignition zone or that five feet of the home or either uh, low intensity surface fire or an accumulation of embers can lead to structural ignition. Um, like Michelle said, we really want to emphasize the home, any attached decks or any outbuildings, anything close to the home that can be considered part of the home uh, when we're focusing on this home ignition zone. Um, what I'm going to spend the rest of, rest of my presentation talking about is now working your way out from the home and managing fuels on the landscape uh, to address uh, home ignition, either from direct flame contact or from uh, radiant heat generated from uh, uh, close proximity wildfire. Um, so when we're, we're managing the landscape and we're managing the fuels on the landscape, um, we're, we're really getting back to the wildfire triangle. So, um, you know, we, we can't do much to control the topography we can't control the weather, but we can break the chain of the wildfire triangle by managing fuels on your property and adjacent to your property. Uh, this can come in, in many different, different shapes and forms, whether we're pruning vegetation or removing ladder fuels to prevent uh, individual tree torching or group torching, or we can uh, break continuous crown fuels in the canopy, whether that's spacing individual trees or spacing clumps of trees to break that that chain that uh that chain of fuels so when we're managing right around the home uh trying to keep that radiant heat at bay what does that look like and, and a lot of a lot of homeowners have this impression when we're recommending defensible space or 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 the management of fuels on on, on a landscape level uh, a lot of landowners uh, have a picture that that's a, a clear cut on their property that's removing all vegetation uh, up to 100 feet from the home. But 
but that's not necessarily the case. We can achieve that with leaving residual trees even within 100 feet of the home if we modify the fuel load and modify the fuel arrangement to reduce the, the rate of spread and reduce the, the, the heat generated should a wildfire burn close to the structure. Um, these are some before and after pictures of, of managed properties in, in, in Gunnison County here. and. Um, uh, some, some pictures of, of management in Lawful Pine on the left and Douglas Fir on the right. But essentially what we've tried to do is we've tried to, to create separation between continuous crown fuels. We've tried to address ladder fuels to keep that fire on the surface should it come close to the home. And we've really tried to reduce that fuel load to reduce the, the amount of heat generated should a fire burn close to the property. Now, after addressing fuels close to the home, uh, it's, it is important to take maybe a landscape scale approach looking at the bigger landscape and how fire may burn across the landscape. Uh, this picture here shows an example of the 2018 Buffalo Fire in Silverthorne, Colorado, where some larger fuel breaks were really credited for the, uh, for the prevention of structure loss. Um, you can see how, how fire suppression efforts utilize these fuel breaks through uh, air attack and slurry lines to uh, control the the direction and, and rate of spread of, of the wildfire in this community. Um, it's also important to, to, to take this fire adapted community approach um, and, and, and look at the wildfire issue as not just an issue of your home, but as a community, a community issue. So uh, a fire adapted community is a community taking responsibility and implementing actions to reduce the community's wildfire risk. And these communities that are adapted to wildfire are better protected communities in a, as a whole. So, so this is really incorporating many different things, whether that's that's uh, fuels and land management, that's home preparedness, uh, that's government participation and planning through the, the drafting of uh, community wildfire protection plans or hazard mitigation plans, uh, that's fire department preparedness and planning, and that's collaborative uh, relationships with various partnerships. And when all of these pieces come together, uh, the community as a whole becomes adapted to fire. Um, for landowners that need assistance, there are, are numerous resources available to you. In, in the state of Colorado, landowners can contact your local CSFS field office for technical assistance. Uh, there's oftentimes local, state, and or federal grant funding that may be available for hazardous fuels reduction. And then there's numerous collaboratives and nonprofit organizations that establish just for this purpose for community assistance. Um, in Colorado, we have Fire Adapted Colorado, which is uh, 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 a collaboration of various nonprofit organizations like Wildfire Adapted Partnerships in Durango, Colorado, that has worked with uh, communities impacted by the 416 fire or, the, or the, on the fire burning right now, the East Canyon fire. Uh, there are organizations like the West Region Wildfire Council in Montrose, Colorado, that work with uh, landowners throughout the western part of the state to reduce their wildfire risk. So um, for, for landowners living in uh, high wildfire risk areas, you don't have to do this alone. There are resources available to help you uh, achieve your uh, wildfire preparedness objectives. Um, and, and, and really, ultimately, in a fire event, what you guys are doing by preparing for wildfire now is you're helping firefighters help you. So firefighters count on the homeowners to do their part. Homeowners who mitigate their risk can increase their safety and the safety of responding firefighters. You can also help firefighters by reducing or eliminating fuels and ignition sources within the home ignition zone, uh, reducing the potential for structural ignition. This may be more important now than it has ever been before as, as uh, fire management resources are operating under novel constraints due to, the, due to the coronavirus pandemic and their ability to respond may be impacted this year. Um, first responders will do, to, do their best to, to manage wildfire and actively suppress it when necessary. However, uh, variable quarantine guidelines will impact resource sharing, interstate travel, and other traditional incident, incident management practices in a novel way, uh, making individual land and homeowner wildfire, wildfire preparedness 
all the more important during this year's fire season. And, and before I hand this off to Michelle to, to end the presentation, I did want to emphasize the importance of evacuation planning. If you do live in a wildfire risk area, it's important that you're ready to evacuate at any time. Um, it's important to develop and practice a fire evacuation plan, uh, identifying your escape routes, your points of contact, how you're going to communicate with your family members. Um, it, for a lot of landowners living in rural environments, it's important to have a plan for evacuating livestock, uh, and as well as a plan for evacuating pets. Um, landowners living in at-risk areas can register their phone numbers with county or reverse 911 systems or other emergency no notification databases. And it's important to, to be prepared with a, a, a go bag or a grab and go disaster supply kit with necessary items like cash, water, prescription medicine, maybe some important documents, some family photos. Um, you have a plan for, for, for getting getting that uh, those important uh, materials with you and ready to go should the need to evacuate arise. Um, and, and Michelle, I'll hand it over to you here to, to end the presentation. Uh, Mike, before she does, um, I wanted to interject with a question. Uh, yes, sir. So, we had a question come in from Rob, and it, it's more of a, of a statement, but I'm hoping that maybe you can you can comment on this. Um, he's saying it would be good for folks to understand the home triage process that firefighters will go through to determine which homes will be protected and which will be left alone because there's just too much danger with no defensible space and flammable materials in the home. Now, I'm not sure how the firefighters would necessarily know about the flammable materials in the home, but they can obviously look at the exterior and see what's going on there um is this is this something that does happen and can you if it is can you talk through that process a little bit yeah absolutely so so uh, as, as michelle alluded to in one of her previous slides um when numerous homes uh become involved and we have conflagration issues it's very easy for wildfire suppression to become overwhelmed now, also, even before that, there are situations where firefighter safety is a, is a serious issue, and, and sometimes first responders are on the spot making a go or no-go decision based on variable factors on, on the current uh, behavior of the wildfire, current climatic conditions, maybe access onto property, or what can be done to, to, to protect that property. So there's a, there's a lot of variables at play, but um, uh, oftentimes if wildfire responders don't feel safe going into an area, the safety of the firefighters is gonna take precedence over the protection of, of, of property and resources. So that's really where, where, where we're emphasizing that, that landowners should do their part to make fire suppression easier on our first responders will have a much better chance at, at, at uh, at re uh, receiving assistance during a, an emergency event. Okay, great. Uh, we've got other questions, but uh, we can we can deal with those after Michelle uh, wraps up her presentation. So Michelle, go right ahead. When I'm. I taking it you can see the screen okay so I'll just go ahead I wanted to wrap it up with some free tools and resources that are available from NFPA uh, this is something you know uh, wherever you live around uh, the country that you can access so I'm not sure if folks are here from Colorado or elsewhere but uh, I'll go ahead with those um, and I'm not looking at my uh, I'm not sure I'm looking at the right uh, slide so <laughs> trying to advance slides let's see i can i can see your slide talking about tools and resources yes i'd like to get to i've got about three more slides to just demonstrate and give you some uh links but if that doesn't work quickly i can just speak to it briefly um so uh let's see oh there we go there we go um 
yep, preparing homes for wildfire. Uh, this is one of uh, a number of digital assets that we have that you can download for free. We have a version in English and a version in Spanish. It covers a lot of the things I spoke to today about the home ignition zone, the primary threats to homes from wildfire, and then uh, the steps you can take to start re to reduce your ignition potential. Trying to advance. Okay, so the wildfire research fact sheets. Um, I mentioned the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, or IBHS. We've collaborated with them as they do their full-scale testing on homes uh, from embers and, and flames of their findings about all the questions that people have about such things as decks, fences, their attics and crawl space vents, uh, roofing, uh, and even coatings, which they actually find aren't all that helpful, uh, but you can see what they've come up with and their recommendations uh, at the with these free resources on our website. So you can reach them at uh, basically it's nfpa.org slash wildfire for almost everything I'm speaking to uh, right now. Um, uh, we also have a free e-learning, a uh, really fun video uh, or a video-based uh, training uh, you can take, Understanding the Wildfire Threat to Homes, that includes voice narration, video, and quizzes, again, available in English or in Spanish. Uh, and you can see one of our pictures, uh, we have some great interviews with Dr. Jack Cohen, uh, again, uh, speaking to uh, the research that uh, has, has uh, helped us develop these recommendations and practices. Uh, finally, we are uh, we are on social media. Um, on the left, Twitter is the at Firewise. Uh, we use this to share resources and to share with others and share information from a lot of our partners out there. And on the right is a, po a typical post from our our Facebook page, which is facebook.com/firewise, where I think a lot more of our residential um, uh, community members are out there on Facebook, probably more than Twitter. So it's a great area for sharing. If if you have a, a neighborhood a page or anything like that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to cover um, was, uh, let's see, our, yes, FireWise USA recognition program. Um, Mike spoke um, to the fire adapted communities concept, which moves from what you do at your home out to the wide landscape and community. Uh, this particular program fits nicely with that. It's been around for, almost two decades, um, and Firewise USA is a voluntary program that gives you a process uh, and a framework to work with your neighbors to get organized, find direction about how you can start to address wildfire risks, and then taking action to increase ignition resistance of your home and, and your neighbors' homes. Um, right now, there are more than 1,700 uh, of these sites across the United States. And at last count, we had 185 active sites in the state of Colorado, which is tied with Oregon for second place after California with regard to the most sites per state. And I put up the URL quickly to get you there to learn more, which is um, firewise.org. So I think we probably still have some questions, but that wraps it up for me. And I want to thank uh, Mike for being such an awesome co-presenter and thank Green Builder Media for the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks. All right, great. Yes, we do have some questions. And uh, if the audience has more questions, please don't hesitate to send them in via the questions box. Um, so we're gonna go back in time a little bit uh, to earlier in the presentation, um, to something that Mike was talking about. Uh, Paulo wanted to know, uh, instead of trying to use a fire triangle of weather, fuel, and topography that you mentioned, to understand wild urban land, or uh, WUE uh, fires, sorry, I'm trying to use your acronyms here. Um, shouldn't we be thinking in a tetrahedron in which the additional side is the construction? Yeah, no, that, that's that's a, a great question. And, and, and how I um, view home constructions uh, when I'm out working with landowners doing site visit, discussing wildfire preparedness, is, is we think about the home construction as a fuel source itself. So I I, I believe that that homes um, are another fuel model, just like the pine, just like the shrubs, and that um, that they can be managed in a similar way. Um, we had a question come in from Rob. Uh, he wanted to know uh, what you thought 
of residential or community cisterns that firefighters could use to assist in home protection. I personally know a builder in the Hill Country of Texas that, that employs this with some of his neighborhoods where he has you know, very, very large cisterns that are buried in the ground. And that's what the firefighters can access because he does not actually have a potable uh, source of water. He, he's able to capture all the rainwater and supply the homes in the community with water for not just their residential usage, but for irrigation and also for fire suppression. So what do you think about a, a, an idea like that? Um, I'll jump in if that's okay. Um, it's um, it's something I'm actually a little bit familiar with from working on NFPA codes and standards. There's actually a standard currently, we have numbers for everything. So if you haven't memorized your numbers, you, you need to look your keywords. <laughs> 1141 covers essentially the ideas around um, things that you need to do for fire protection infrastructure if you are in areas that are not on a grid or a typical municipal, you know, the assumptions we all make that we have um, the proper roads and water supplies and all this for firefighting uh, might be very different in areas that have um, developed out of old agricultural land or once used to be um, summer homes and have converted to full-time living. Uh, not everybody uh, maybe buying into those areas realizes, oh, there isn't any water for firefighting in my community. So there's actually that 1141, I believe you just look it up at nfpa.org slash 1141 and uh, read all the sort of legislative language it has, but it recommends um, a number of things, including there's quite a lot of material about how um, dry hydrants and or cisterns, different systems you can use um, alternatives to having a municipal water supply that we supply firefighting. So uh, there's that recognition that in rural um, uh, communities or, or even uh, communities that your systems are not going to look the way they look in a in a Denver perhaps. So, so there is some guidance and I think those are all really smart ways of uh, coping that. Um, but it's it's a little opening some times when residents realize um, just how um, chancy it is to rely on, you know, the fire truck pulling up and it's all be okay because it is not set up uh, necessarily in the way they might be used to if they move from a more uh, urban area. Yeah, that, that's great, Michelle, and I might just echo on that, um, that that these water sources for firefighting response. Mike, were there more questions uh, for us? Uh, um, I'm sorry, there was some lag there, Mike. Keep going. Oh yeah, I'm not. I, I'm sorry. So, so I, I just wanted to, to dovetail on, on Michelle's response and, and say that that any water sources uh, created for firefighter response, whether that's a dry hydrant or a, a cistern, um, should be identified with your local fire protection district or in a community wildfire protection plan, so that. Um, it's known that those resources do exist um, because it's not going to do much good if the firefighters don't know that that cistern has been created for their use. Okay. That's a really great point, Mike. Um, to follow up on that a little bit, um, some of the communities out in the wildland urban interface, like in the Colorado foothills, um, and this speaks to really codes more so than something voluntary like the cisterns, but they require space for the fire engine to turn around. And I live here in the Midwest, and I even see that um, in cul-de-sac situations. Is that something that you're seeing uh, codified and, and implemented uh, on a wide scale, not just in wildfire prone areas? Yeah, you know, it, it is hit or miss dependent on the community and and and, and turnarounds for emergency of vehicles um, provide more than just fire response assistance. It can also help with uh, medical response, maybe for ambulance to get into the community and get turned around. But uh, but if, if firefighter safety and evacuation is a legitimate factor that is triaged 
when firefighters are in the community looking at homes and if they don't have uh, a spot where they can get their vehicles turned around that can make uh, that can influence their no go or go situation on if they approach the house to provide uh, uh, structure defense. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that, Mike, that um, that is actually another element in that document I just mentioned in NFP 1141 that, again, uh, a lot of communities are, are not designed um, with that in mind, that, oh, we're going to have a fire truck that needs to get up this uh, slope, up this driveway, and then be able to turn around at the end or into this neighborhood. So, um, so yeah, that that is something that um, I do think that you know, that's becoming more well known that that is a need. But I also think that that idea of kind of the mapping and the knowledge that the fire department has of the community layout and resources is really critical. And I just sent out to the um, to the attendees in the chat box um, the link that you sent me, Michelle, about the uh, NFPA 1141 document. And then also, uh, Mary's going to put that in the follow-up email as well, so all the attendees will get that link. Um, and and this next question, I think, is you know certainly either of you can take it. I'm, I'm kind of looking, figuratively speaking, in Michelle's direction when I ask this question. Uh, it comes from Eric. Are there neighborhood community scale? So you know, just the wider scale than uh, maybe even a neighborhood. Maybe it's community scale development planning guidelines for resilience in areas prone to wildfires? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think actually, and I'm and I'm uh, remiss because I don't have the URL right at the tip of my tongue um, or my computer at the moment, but there is um, sort of a, a broad scale um, Colorado hazards and planning uh, website that's really, really well done. And I think it integrates a lot of um, the different state agency rules, regulations, guidance, et cetera, but um, it does cover wildfire along with um, multiple different um, natural hazards to which you'd want to plan and develop in a, in a resilient way. So yeah, as you, know, as, as you can probably tell, the NFPA standards are really pretty focused on fire and related hazards to that versus say flood or land fl uh, mud, mud flows or uh, other kinds of, uh, of events. Um, I will maybe need to follow up with that if I if I can't find it right uh, quick, um, but that's a very good resource within Colorado that um, uh, I'm not sure about other states, but I am familiar with that document. And we might be able to distribute that to our attendees via the follow-up email, uh, the post webinar email as well. Um, right. We have we have David joining us. David's uh, actually uh, he's he's a, attending from Spain. So we appreciate David uh, hanging out with us uh, late on a Wednesday evening. Um, but he says in Europe, uh, we use mostly unburnable materials in the roofing, such as clay tiles. However, he warns that the roofs are vulnerable to fire embers when no maintenance is observed. You know, those little cracks or displacements are sometimes enough for embers to enter mm -hmm. and ignite the wood structure below. So, um, so a warning from from David over in Spain, but he did say that uh, they've been considering the implications of fuel treatments around the house in terms of modifying the local air circulation. That uh, uh, canopies are good protection to strong winds, but has there been any consideration to this aerodynamic component? I think I know which David from Spain this is. This is Michelle David Caballero. Uh, um, yeah, bienvenido him. and thank you. Um, and he has done uh, much research in Europe and has collaborated with some of the some of the North Americans on this over the years. So probably is a lot more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but uh, I do think there's arguments for you know. Uh, again, we tend to talk to about things very close to the house uh, when we're talking about the science that we know of that can help. So Mike may have a better idea on that landscape scale of that kind of influence. Yeah, I know that that is a a great question. I mean, even even thinking about uh, the management on on a landscape, if we do some significant management, not only are we uh, influencing how winds flow through that sand, 
We're also influencing, you know, moisture in the understory. If we open up the crown and we allow more sunlight down to the forest floor, we are we are potentially getting drier uh, field conditions on the ground. Now we have to really get back to what our objectives are, and and if our objective is to uh, limit the amount of radiant heat around the structure. Um, then I think we can we can still achieve that through some of our traditional landscape management recommendations. But for landowners living in, in a high risk area, this is maybe a situation where it would be helpful to to reach out to um, to, to seek that technical assistance in, in designing uh, fuels uh, fuels mitigation projects to um, address some of these objectives. Okay. Um Real quick, uh, Bill chimed in that the Department of Local Affairs in Colorado is upgrading their resiliency framework um, and that they focus on multiple resiliency issues, including fire. So um, there's a local reference there if you're in Colorado. Um, wanted to get to a question from Chris, and it's interesting because I was just talking to somebody else about this topic earlier today. Um, Chris asked, what about the concept of unvented attics where there are no vents, and there's spray insulation along the roof slope instead of the attic floor. Would that prevent entrance of embers and firebrands better than simply putting screens over vents? Um, I could speak a little to it. And again, um, I am not the building materials scientist, but I, I know some people who are. <laughs> um, I know that IBHS and um, also um, Dr. Steve Quarles, who was affiliated both with them and with UC Berkeley, um, who is a building materials scientist, uh, you know, they actually do recommend, you know, and it's not going to work for every situation and every home type or every environment, but if you can avoid having vents, if there are other solutions to that, um, and even in some cases they're saying if you can avoid having gutters because gutters collect debris and debris, uh, you know, it also collects embers when they, when they fly. So um, there are alternatives to this traditional um, building, but uh, essentially the vents are basically to, um, uh, circulate the air, and so that that is um, that is an important consideration for for homes. Um, so I think that you know what the what the building materials folks are finding, or they you know, uh, is there are alternatives to what we traditionally think of as building. But one of the interesting things with vents, um, you know, you can do some venting that is less vulnerable because of where it is on the roof and that the gable end vents, which is sort of, if you think of the triangle of a roof on that flat surface below the point of the triangle, that's the gable end. Um, and if you think of a straight line wind, uh, it is pretty much gonna blow embers in there, um, you know, uh, if, it, if, it la if the winds last long enough in that direction. So yeah, it's there's a there's a lot to do with research that hasn't been done yet. So we uh, we offer you what we what we already know and what we uh, we hope that people will be coming up with some of these great solutions. All right. Uh, wanted to make sure to put the final call out there for questions from our audience, and I'm going to keep moving on to uh, other questions that we still have. Um, you know, I actually had a question, um, and this was geared a little bit more towards Mike. Um, are there certain species of trees that tend to be more susceptible or conducive to wildfire spread? Yes, there are. So um, there, there are, you know, most of, of the ecosystems in, in the state of Colorado and uh, the Western United States have been influenced in some way or another by wildfire they, they are fire adapted species so so when we're looking at a, say a logical pine forest type um it it, it grows in, in a high density it has a uh, serotonous cones that open up underneath a wildfire event so so there are certain forest types that are evolved to uh support um high wildfire behavior um Con conversely, there there are other species that are maybe less vulnerable or have uh, uh, less um, intense wildfire behavior should a fire enter those stands. And, and some of some of those species that I'm thinking about are maybe uh, some of the deciduous trees in the state, like uh, aspen or narrow leaf cottonwood, that have 
um, uh, maybe a slightly higher fuel moistures. Um, they have less volatile chemicals uh, and they have um, less fine fuels than maybe a, a washable pine stand with uh, numerous, uh, 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 with a significant accumulation of debris on the forest floor and uh, fine needles that, uh, that are pretty much connected through the crown. Okay. Still getting some good questions coming in. And by the way, um, this will this will probably also be in the follow-up email, but uh, uh, planningforhazards.com. Planningforhazards.com is another good site to go to. Um, we have a question uh, coming in from Michael, uh, not me, somebody else. <laughs> um, are there situations where shelter in place actually makes sense? The sixty million dollar question. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, David Caballero, my friend, is on, and he has looked at um, the post disaster events in both Portugal and Greece. Uh, Mati, uh, which was a horrific fire that I don't think that I could talk about um, uh, without a lot of emotion. Um, but uh, you know, it it takes quite a lot to be able to safely shelter in place. It has been done. In terms of a policy or a way of doing things in the United States, it is very fraught. And um, in fact, uh, over 10 years ago, uh, there were a number of fire chiefs and other advocates who were saying, you know, if we just built and designed things better, just as we've been talking about on this webinar, we could allow people, it would be safer for, than people getting out on the road and potentially getting uh, killed and all this. And wouldn't that be the ideal? And actually started to advocate for it. And then um, Black Saturday happened in um, Australia where hundred more than 175 people lost their lives, many of whom stayed at, at home. Um, many of whom were really not prepared to stay at home and were not prepared for the severity of what happened. Um, so it's a really fraught topic. I don't think it's impossible. And I know I have met people who have actually sheltered in place. It doesn't mean they hunker down in the bathtub. It means they're actively um, aware and fighting a fire right around their home, putting out spot fires, um, you know, uh, making sure they don't get dehydrated. It's quite strenuous. It can go on for hours and hours and hours. So it's not simply I hide in the house till it's over. <laughs> it's a really complex um, kind of strategy. And it's not something that um, our, you know, certainly on a national level or even a regional level, as far as I know, that fire services are willing to embrace because of the um, tremendous variability and the tremendous risk to life that are, that are potentially um, possible. Yeah, and, and I, I would agree with Michelle on that. I think uh, I think it is possible in certain situations to shelter in place, but wildfires tend to be chaotic with a lot of variables and a lot of unpredictability. And I, I think uh, the landowners should really have an evacuation plan prepared and be ready to go at the at the first notice um, to, to, to protect their lives. And I'm guessing the uh, respective uh, homeowner's life insurance carrier may not necessarily want them to be sheltering in place in some of these situations. So, um, yeah, there's there's tr tremendous risk in that kind of situation. Sure. Um, I think it's also it's also a human behavior type of problem where the people who have studied what what has happened and what and also what people intend to do, um, what actually does happen is people wait and see, and they often wait too long. Um, to make a good decision. And so they're not prepared to do either uh, leaving or staying very safely. Um, and that's really, really unfortunate. So I, I fully agree with Mike that the best strategy is to prepare your home as best you can and be ready to protect your family um, and, and yourself by getting out of harm's way if, if humanly possible. And speaking of preparing, uh, Cameron had a question about uh, uh, does FEMA have uh, good hardening guidelines? Um, this is Michelle. Um, so 
I think FEMA's mitigation practices would follow the kinds of things that we just discussed. Um, as far as I know, they don't have anything that we haven't talked about already. Uh, they would be consistent and in line pretty much with what NFPA, IBHS, um, other other agencies, U.S. Forest Service and others have um, have worked on for a long time. So uh, if, if, if if they come up with better ones, we will be the first ones to be adopting those. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think you, what you'll find, which is good, is that they're consistent with what we've just discussed. Very good. Uh, a question came in from Patrick. Uh, he says, although long-term fire-resistant coatings wear out and have limited effectiveness, um, how good are foams or gels that can be applied immediately before an evacuation? Mike, do you want to address that? Um, I can't yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so that that is an option. Um, there, there are a lot of fire protection districts that have some sort of capacity to run foams and gels through their pump systems that can be used in structure defense. Um, really, I'm going to I'm going to emphasize on what we've been talking about all day is that. Um, as a homeowner, you're probably going to have a lot more effectiveness at preparing your home for wildfire before it happens by uh, managing the home ignition zone, doing the best to harden your structure, and managing the fuels that could pose a risk to your structure. And then, uh, and instead of you know, I, I would recommend instead of messing around with fuels and uh, excuse me with. Uh, with foams and gels as a wildfire approaches, I would much rather emphasize a good evacuation plan in place. And if your home is adequately prepared, uh, let the fire suppression response uh, uh, use those materials on your home if needed. I think that's a great response, Mike. I think that echoes what I've heard from fire service folks around the country, which is uh, we, we really don't want people attempting, which would take a long time, if you think about how large a house is, to foam down your own house uh, while a fire is approaching, because you do have to do it in a pretty short period of time before the fire approaches, which is not when we want people outside exposed to fire. Um, so so people are very much in line with what Mike is saying, is the, the mitigation and preparation you do in advance, long before the fire comes, is going to pay off uh, in the event. So. Um, doing the last minute things with exposing yourself potentially to harm is um, is is that is the biggest concern. Not not even commenting on whether the foams or gels are effective. It's that again that human behavior element that we worry about. All right. Well, we don't have any other questions, so I want to say a big thank you to both Michelle and Mike for sharing their time with us today and their insight into this incredibly important topic especially as we head into wildfire season. And a big thank you as always to our attendees, no matter where they are located, whether they're all the way over in Spain or somewhere in Colorado or somewhere else. We appreciate all of you for attending and asking your questions because we wouldn't do this without you. Stay tuned to your inbox for more information from Green Builder Media about the next webinar, which will most likely take place in July. Until next time, stay healthy, and I hope you all have a safe, an enjoyable 4th of July, no matter what your plans are this year. So long, everyone.